All right. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. This evening is September 24th, 2023. And after the last few short clips that we've done in the shorts category that you can find right here, we've done three of them just very, very light touching on the, the seven churches in Revelation. And this video is going to be what I call the shareables videos. So we're doing the shorts, you know, within a minute. We're doing the full length videos. You know, I get two, generally two and a half, three hour length videos, the real deep studies in them. And this is the category that I'm calling shareables. And this one here today is going to be on the seven churches of the end of days. And when you get started in this, if you're new to the ministry, new to the channel, it is this this is a ministry with the revelation of the end of days, the opening of the books. And so if you're new, it's really going to catch you off guard because you're going to be learning and hearing and understanding things that you've never heard before. And so the number one place I always recommend people to start is by coming to this link right here on YouTube called Playlists. And it'll bring you to here, right to here. So this right here is that playlist that you would come to called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. And this video right here is the End Time Seven Churches Revealed. And it's a big two hour and change video. And you can come and see it. It was done a little over two years ago. So that's one place you can see it. Or you can search it up in the videos on the YouTube channel or the other option is you can come to ministryrevealed.com, go to the menu, click on the intro page, which is where I'm at here, and you could scroll down to watch the bigger study on it right here. It's a one-click download, or you can just watch it right here as well. But if you're new to the ministry, just like those other videos that you saw on the playlist right here, it's always highly recommended you start with these four videos right here. Just the first one is a 22-minute intro to, to begin to lay the groundwork for you to understand that the revelation of the end of days is about who the Gospels are speaking to and what it reveals for the timeline. So you're going to realize that Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels, in the end of days, the last will be first, the first will be last. It's Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke is pre-trib, Mark is mid-trib, and Matthew is post-trib. You're going to see that all are true, which is why people always debate over them within Scripture that, you know, is it pre-mid or post? Because you could see all of it in Scripture. The answer is they're all true. The third one here in this other intro is the revelation of the years. When you realize it's not just all about Matthew 24, but the other Gospels, like Mark's discourse and Luke's discourse also play their own role in the end of days, you'll realize that the end of days isn't seven years, but 14 years and a little portion called above. And then you're going to say, well, how was this all missed? How can we understand this? And that's where you're going to get it in this one. It's all because of Matthew. And that'll lay out the foundation to help you understand how this wasn't missed, how it wasn't the time. The Lord was keeping it for the time of the end. And you're going to see that because all of our perspective came from Matthew's foundation in the Gospels, every other thing we looked at prophetically started to fall in line with Matthew, whether people knew it or not. But when you realize their differences, see, because the answer is it, it's all about these differences within the Gospels. You read stories and people have debated these for centuries and believe that these differences are just contradictions. Well, they're not. It's all prophetic. And that's what these first four videos are going to make known to you and what they mean. And so after you watch this, if you wanted to go deeper into the seven churches, like I said, you can click right here or you can go to the website and just go through these videos, watch them one by one until you get to it. So as I said, and if you're newer to the ministry and you've been following some of the shorts recently, you'll hear me talk a lot about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I also talk about these differences within the Gospels, and I'll have many more shorts coming about these differences within the Gospels to be able to show quick little snippets of why there's these differences within the wordings to show you that Luke is a separate group of people, Mark is another group, 
and Matthew is another group, pre, mid, and post. And what you come to find out is in the prophetic, this is exactly what Paul was telling us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, and it was like a rapture, like a caught up, like a harpazo to the third heaven. That's the first group. That's the Luke group. But it happens in a period of time before the 14 years, in an above portion of 14 years. That portion we've revealed here over the last, I've been doing this for six years now, and for the last five or so years, five and change, we've been revealing the understanding that that portion called above is 50 days. But not so much the topic of conversation today, but it does tie in, as you'll see, to the seven churches, which is why I'm bringing this up. Then what you see is Paul then gives us another typology in himself saying, and I knew such a man. So the first one was in Christ, like a rapture to the third heaven. The other one is like the first man, not quite the same guys that were in Christ, but, you know, they came to Christ. And this one, it says, was caught up into paradise. So not like a rapture. This one is the main rapture that people like to think of, but they go to paradise. And then what you see is you go down further and it says, now behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So you have the first one a taking, the second one a taking, and the third a return, pre, mid, and post. First one to the third heaven, second one to paradise. Third one is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, bringing no more, no more burden to them and so forth. So this is foundational things to understand because when you get into the seven churches, it's going to be so powerful because the seven churches in relation to their end of days has been a mystery that people have been seeking for centuries. We, we've seen the typologies and people for, and, and theologians for a long time have understood that the, the typologies in the Old Testament, in the was, there's pictures, there's typologies in the seven churches in how the Old Testament played out over about 2,500 or so years. And then, of course, the obvious one that most of us know is the is. From Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape, we're living in the is. So there's the was, there's the is, and there's the is to come. And the is of the seven churches is also something that's quite easy. And many people, you know, maybe there's a difference of how they stagger the years in how it would play out. You know, maybe if Ephesus played out over this many years and somebody else might say, oh, no, it was over this many years before Smyrna started. And others might say, no, Smyrna started here in, you know, 20 years earlier. Those are minor differences, but we know that they've been playing out also in the picture of the last 2000 years. And it will continue until the pre-trib escape. Well, we are right now, the whole world of church understands, as far as I've ever heard, and knows that we are in the Laodicean church right now. So we are currently in the Laodicean age of the seven churches, the time of this falling away. The problem is, because we're in this age and this period of the falling away, and the is to come of the seven churches has never yet been understood. Now, we've revealed it here, and we've understood it for a few years, but in general, it had never been understood until here. And so what's happened is because it's believed that we are in Laodicea, which we are, that it's almost like that's the end of the church age. Once that church age is done, it's over. You see? So they'll say there's no more mention of the church after chapter, what is it, three or four, of the book of revelation so there's no more church because the church is all gone that's not how it works the only reason that pastors have told us this over the years if you've heard it is because the understanding of the seven churches in the is to come had not yet been understood so everything they're teaching is in the is in the visual of the is because we're in laodicea so they see us being in the end of the seven churches. So when it's done, it's done, but it's not. There's a play coming in the is to come and the period plays out over what Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 was telling us in a period called above 
and 14 years. And that's what we're going to go through today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My voice just cracked a bit. I had a cold. I had a sinus cold. I've gotten over it. It's about two days since I've gotten over, but there's still a little bit there. <laughs> Sip of coffee time. So let's get into this. The Church of Ephesus. So we see in Ephesus, and we have this conversation in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, the first church, and we see that there's a connection to the apostles. So it says, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. So it's it's a test like there's people calling themselves apostles who are not, but who are the ones that are the picture being represented here? Well, they're the apostles. They're the apostles proving out that these guys aren't the apostles. And what does that mean in the end of days? In the end of days, what's going to happen is when that above portion of 50 days starts before the 14 years, it's going to begin with the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. And on that same day, the Lord is going to anoint like he did in John chapter 20. He's going to anoint. Let's go to John chapter 20. It's, it's the typology of history that will play out again. Does it mean he's going to come and he's going to breathe on them? I don't know if it's going to play out exactly like that. But this is what happened after his resurrection in this period of 50 days. He meets with the apostles. He breathes on them and they receive the Holy Ghost. Now, this period of time actually lasted for about seven days. And then the Lord returned again on the eighth day. And this time Thomas was there. So look at what this means. When you look at it in the prophetic, so this is from the Ministry Revealed book on the part of the seven churches. You'll find it on page 128 of the book. You can download it for free PDF on ministryrevealed.com or in the description box under this video. Or if you want a paperback, you can always go get it from Amazon. But this is something that wasn't done by me. I've just taken it and I've used it because what had happened is... These are people throughout history that understood the prophetic in the Old Testament typologies of the seven churches that have played out in the Old Testament. So this is what I was saying, played out over about 2,500 years, whereas the is is where we are right now. So from the time of the death and resurrection time frame all the way to our present day to which we're living in the Laodicean church. So these were the different church ages. So we've got about 2,500 years that played out here. We've got about uh, 2,000 years that played out here. But there's still an is to come. But do you know what the difference is? It's going to be way more intense. This all played out over like 4,500 or so years, whereas this is going to play out in 14 years. 50 days and 14 years. So it is going to be much more intense. And this is why when you go into the discourses, I'll show you in Mark's discourse and in Matthew's discourse, which represent Mark's are the seven years of seals. Matthew's represent the seven years of trumpets. And this is why you see at the abomination of desolation in Mark, which I'm going to show you where it is in scripture. And then, uh, uh, sorry, in the churches. And then I'm going to show you where it is in the churches. Uh, for Matthew's abomination, but we have the abomination uh, of desolation right here in Mark. And listen to what it says after. In verse 13, in chapter in chapter 13, verse 19, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time. Yikes. This means the intensity and and the veracity and the the all of it is going to be something that played out over thousands of years is going to be so compacted into the craziest time in human history up to this point. But by mid trumpets, it's going to be even worse because listen to what it says here, because what most people I've got videos on this as well about there being two abominations. You see one in Daniel 11 and you see one in Daniel 12. Most people haven't realized that there's two. There's one in Mark and there's one in Matthew. People haven't understood the reason for these differences. And that's what you'll come to understand as you, as you come to understand uh, who the Gospels are speaking to. So here's the abomination 
uh, in Matthew 24, and this is after the temple has been built. This is when Messiah is cut off. This is at mid-trumpet's time. And listen to what it says. In Matthew 24, verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. And then it adds, no, nor ever shall be. So in Mark's, it only said unto this time. And then in Matthew's, it's going to be so much worse because you'll realize that this is when Satan's been cast down and the pit is open that now at this point, it's going to be worse than it ever has been. and It'll never be worse than this ever again. So what you're seeing here within the seven churches is what played out over thousands, plays out over 14 years and a little bit of change. And it's going to be chaotic. So what is it with Ephesus? Well, Ephesus was during the apostolic age. It was the time of the apostles. It was the time of the apostles going out. So hence, it's starting with the apostles. And when you understand it's the beginning of the 50 days after the pre-trib escape, how fitting that it's connected to John at the beginning of the 50 days at Jesus' resurrection. And what's the picture in the end of days from John chapter 20 in the end time typology is the resurrection is you've got the pre-trib escape that's gone. He comes and anoints the apostles, uh, the apostles and the apostolic age begins. And he's gone for one week for the Gentile wedding, the first seven days of those first 50 days. And look what happens. The escape happens. He comes same day at evening. He anoints them and then he leaves and doesn't return till the eighth day because he's gone to the Gentile wedding. That's the picture. And look at what it's called. The day of Israel's espousals. I didn't make this. When I saw this, I knew exactly because I had already learned and understood the differences in the Gospels. And I'd been trying to discern the differences within the seven churches to the end of days. And when it all came to fruition about three or so years ago, it was explosive. So this is the start. The pre-trib happens. The seven days, the apostles are now anointed and doing their thing while the Lord's gone to the wedding, the Gentile wedding of Luke. And when he returns on the eighth day, he meets with the apostles one more time briefly. And then he goes and meets with the Luke 24 group. So in Luke chapter 24, he comes to meet with this group, the two on the road to Emmaus. He meets with the two on the road to Emmaus. They follow him. They hang out with him. He serves them and eats with them. And then they're given their mandate to go out and to preach, but to go where the others are and to wait till they're empowered from on high. So they're following the Lord for those 40 days. What is this 40 days represented by? It's represented by Luke chapter 21 in his discourse. So here we are right now. This began the 50 days. Then the Lord's gone during the first seven of the 50 to the wedding. He returns on the eighth day. And now he's meeting with the Smyrna group represented by those workers of Luke 24, those disciples. And when he meets with them, persecution is going to begin with these guys. It's not, the, it's not the fleeing into the wilderness of Mark's discourse yet. It's the beginning of persecution during the 40 days of the Son of Man. Yes, the Son of Man is going to be here for 40 days. And watch what happens. We go into Luke chapter 21. And the 40 days, which is the eighth day from the beginning of the 50. And in Luke chapter 21, listen to what we read. In verse 10, it says, Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Great earthquakes and so forth. But look at what verse 12 says. But before all these. You don't get any of this wording in Mark's discourse or in Matthew's. It's just straight starts with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is the red horse rider. The white horse rider is the son of man, excuse me, called the but before all of these. This is where persecution is going to begin. Some of you shall be cast into prison and killed. Look at what it says in verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you, they shall cause to be put to death. Okay? So if you go to 
the the seven churches again if we go back into revelation chapter 2 we're going to see here when we get to smyrna listen to what it says about them i know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty fear none of those things which thou shalt which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and have tribulation 10 days but be thou faithful unto death and i will give thee the crown of life and listen to what it says in verse 11 of revelation 2 he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death so who is this group that's going to follow the son of man for 40 days in that portion of the 50 when he returns from the wedding, who is this group? Well, they're not only going to follow him during the 40 days, they're going to remain during the tribulation as well, at least during the tribulation of seals, and some maybe even further along. We see in Luke's discourse right there that they're the same, some of you, that are going to be put to death. But look at what happens. They won't be hurt by the second death. Do you know there's only one group in Revelation chapter 20, that's not part of the second death. And who is it? Well, this is how you know that the Smyrna workers are going to remain to work at least not just during the 40 days, but also during the seals. We can see it right here because it says it was the souls of those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ. They never took the mark of the beast, never worshipped, uh, never had, uh, um, never worshipped him never received the mark in their hand, uh, on their hand or on their forehead. And what happens? They get to live a thousand years with the Lord. But the rest of the dead live not again until the end of the millennial reign. So these are the ones that have part in the first resurrection, which it then says in, in Revelation 20, verse 6, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and they shall reign with him a thousand years. So you know exactly who the Smyrna group are. They're there with the son of man for 40 days and they remain at least during seals. What about the apostles? The apostles, the same thing. They're going to remain at least during seals, but they have specific work. Their work pertains to the, the spiritual foundation being laid while there's actual uh, actually going to be a physical foundation being laid during the time of seals because Jerusalem's going to get destroyed at the end of 50 days and then eventually they'll call, allow it to get rebuilt, but only the foundation will be rebuilt during the time of seals. When their work is done, look at where they go. They get to be a part of the paradise of God. And this is for, of course, the the apostles how do we know the apostles are responsible for the foundation watch this we have videos that show that the the foundation will get laid for the temple during seals but when you see new jerusalem coming down knowing that the apostles are responsible for the the spiritual foundation being laid on the earth you see it right here at the end of the millennial reign when new jerusalem is coming down the 12 tribes represent the 12 gates. The 12 foundations represent the 12 apostles. The walls are the 144, which it says cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. So you have the 144 that represent the spiritual walls. You have the apostles representing the spiritual foundations. And you have the 12 tribes representing the gates. So you have foundations first during seals. You have the walls that will be built when the, when the temple is built during the first half of trumpets. And then you have the gates through which everybody will enter during the millennial reign. Those are the three workers of that portion, one in seals, one in trumpets, and one during the millennial reign, which is John's group, Mark's group at the end, and Matthew's group at the end. Where's the Luke group? Well, we just saw them in um uh, uh in smyrna and we saw them in revelation chapter 20 that will be the priests ruling and reigning with christ during the millennial reign so there are four groups of workers but the last group 
is the one that works during the millennial reign. So we're not really talking about the millennial reign. I'm just pointing some of these things out as we go along the way. And so right there, you could see that this Smyrna group and that some of them are going to be put to death and that they're going to have part in the resurrection so that they won't be able to be hurt by the second death. That means these guys who put their necks on the line are the ones that are going to take part in that. And they're directly correlated to the ones in Luke chapter 21 that we saw during the 40 days of the Son of Man because these events are all happening before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is what you see here. So this is how these... This is how you're starting to see how these seven churches play out. These are the first two, and those first two churches are all part of the 50 days, just the 50 days, but they remain as well, okay? They will remain during seals. Now, look what happens when we come to Pergamum. In Revelation 2, verse 13, it says, um, I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. So all of a sudden, I know where Satan's seed is. And look at this. Uh, Antipas was my faithful martyr. So now you're talking about a period of martyrs. You're talking about knowing where Satan's seed is. Uh, you're talking about them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Okay. So look at what happens when we look at this. And we look at this chart. And we look at Pergamum. What was Pergamum in in the in the uh, is of the church age that we're in? It was the time of Constantine, a type of Antichrist. And what was it in the Old Testament? It's a picture of the fleeing into the wilderness, going into the wilderness. So what are we seeing here in this picture? Look what happens. This brings us to Revelation chapter 12. Look what happens here. In verse 3, and there appeared a wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. So here's the dragon. Here's Satan showing up. And it's about what time frame? It's now we're talking about the midst of seals, maybe two and a half years into the 14 years. The, the 14 years has begun. You're about two and a half years when this wonder of the great dragon now shows up. We just saw where it was in Pergamum. How do you know? that this dragon, which is represented by Satan, we see it lower down here, the great dragon, which is that serpent Satan, he's not yet cast out, but he's seen. And what does he do at this point? Well, if you go to Revelation 13, we also know this is about mid-seals because you see the 10 horns and the crowns and so forth. And we see the lion, the leopard, the bear, and the dragon, uh, um, the, the beast now has power over all of these. But where did the beast get his authority? He got it from the dragon, which gave him his power. So the dragon gives him gives the Antichrist his power at around mid seals, about two and a half years into the 14 years. Right there, about about a little short of the middle of seals. There's the red dragon. It's mid seals. There's the dragon. He's giving beast the power. And how long is he giving the beast the power to continue? <clears throat> Excuse me, for 42 months, which will bring you to the end of the sixth year of seals, which equals the end of the sixth year of seals. Not because it's one seal per year, but that's the way it plays out. So you end up at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of the six years of the first six years of seals is the end of the 42 months that he was given power from the dragon to play out. and. When this power happens, what does it equal? Mark 13, the abomination of desolation. What is the abomination of desolation in Mark chapter 13? Standing where it ought not. The other word for standing can mean placed when you go to the Strongs. So to place where it ought not. That's because the abomination and desolation of desolation in Mark's discourse is not when the temple is built. It's the physical temple because the church that was left behind, that wasn't prepared, and the world that's still to be saved in the great multitude rapture, the, 
the the one that we saw in Second Corinthians, the second one, that's the one because it's still the temple of God, the fleshly portable temple that can be moved. That's this one. That is the people who are still the temple of God at this point. This is why in Revelation chapter 13, you have then the mark of the beast. You have the mark of the beast at this point. That is the abomination of desolation on people during the time of seals. And this is why when we go back to when we go back to Smyrna and we saw what it said about Smyrna, that they wouldn't be hurt by the second death because Revelation 20 told us that they would be resurrected, having put their necks on the line because of what? They never took the mark of the beast or worshiped the beast. You following? So if they never worshiped the beast, they never followed the beast. Now you can see why and when this all happens, when the dragon at about mid-seals is the one giving the power to the beast, and when that happens, it's the time of the mark of the beast, which is the time of the abomination of desolation in Mark's discourse. It's incredible to understand. Now, look what happens. Okay? Look what happens in the discourse. When you look at the discourse, in Mark's discourse, you have no false prophets and you have no false Christs in the first portion of Mark's discourse. It's not until after Mark's abomination of desolation that you then get false Christs and false prophets. Well, isn't that interesting? Because in Mark 13, the false prophet and the false Christ, Antichrist, don't show up Whoops, in Revelation 13, don't show up until he gets his power to continue 42 months and it brings about the mark of the beast. That's how incredible it is. It, it's like a glove. It fits perfectly together when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to and that the discourses go from Luke to Mark to Matthew. It, it's incredible. And now look what happens. So now you've got the time of the Antichrist, and he gets his 42 months. This period of great tribulation, as I showed earlier, or, or, or of tribulation that we were told is, is worse than it was since creation. Because now the Antichrist has his power. They're chasing the Christians. It's, it's chaos. And then look what happens. He's getting his 42 months to rule and reign. And then it says at the coming of Christ, right? It says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. And listen to this. And the stars of heaven shall fall. Go to Revelation 6. Look at what we see in Revelation chapter 6. We're going to see this in a moment. Here's at the fifth seal. Those who were slain for the testimony of God. Why would they be under the altar at the fifth seal for being slain for the testimony of God? If it wasn't because the Antichrist was now here and they were being killed for the testimony like those under the altar and those that will be resurrected. And then look what happens now. The sixth seal comes and we read the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Why is everybody freaking out at the stars falling? Because all of a sudden they're seeing. Hide us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the time of his wrath has come which means something is going to be seen coming. So what does this line up to when we go back into the churches? Well, here's where Antichrist gets his power and the fleeing of Mark's portion into the wilderness. Here's Thyatira during the time of his 42 months. This is when he gets his power at about two and a half years into the 14. This is during his 42 months, the time of dark ages which is what it equaled in the is of the church age. This was the typology of them when they were in the wilderness still. This is to the, this will bring us to the end of the sixth year of seals. And at the end of the sixth year of seals, right at this dividing line, if you will, this just played out chapter three. This just played out chapter three of the first four churches. What, what happens at the end of these four churches? The Son of Man has come on heavenly Mount Zion. And he's here in one form or another during the time of trumpets. 
So you have this period of seals. Then it's over at the end of the sixth year of seals. And Sardis, as you're going to see in a moment, is going to represent the beginning of that seventh year of seals while the Lord is here. But let's continue on even with some of this with Sardis. So here's where we see, uh, sorry, with Thyatira. So here's where we see the them falling. And if we go to Revelation chapter 12, remember all we're doing is following this in order. And his tail drew what? A third part of the stars and did cast them to the earth. <laughs> so we're, we're seeing it in three places. We're seeing it at the end of the time of the sixth seal. We're seeing it in, in uh, after the, the dragon gives power to the Antichrist, to the beast. We're seeing it in Mark's discourse. And so what happens in Mark's discourse after this portion of the stars falling? There's the stars falling. The heavens are shaken, right? And the powers that are in heaven are shaken. And then what are they supposed to see? Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And that word does mean in. So now they're going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Well, isn't that fantastic? That's exactly what they're saying right here at the end of the sixth seal. They're seeing him coming and they're freaking out. Well, what if we go to Revelation chapter 12? Look what happens in Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, look what comes next. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up. So you've got the man child now coming who's going to rule with a rod of iron. Wasn't that fascinating? Watch this. Let's go back into into um actually i'll make a final point here on pergamum because remember they flee into the wilderness so if you look at the picture as moses when they flee into the wilderness they were fed manna in the wilderness so look what happens at pergamum in revelation 2 17 it says will i give to eat of the hidden manna you see all of these clues are throughout each and every part of the seven churches <clears throat> so this is that mark fleeing into the wilderness so that's when he gets his power that's when they flee it's time of the mark of the beast and then thyatira is that 42 month period that takes you to the end of the six years of uh, sixth year of seals when the stones uh, uh when the the stars are falling and we see then the son of man coming in the clouds and we just saw in revelation 12 that that's when he's coming with a rod of iron and it's right before the was caught up. So if we follow this in order, what are we going to see when we get to Thyatira and how does it end? Listen to this in Revelation 2.25. But that which you have already hold fast till I come. Look at this. <clears throat> it's literally to arrive to be present. They see him at the end of the sixth seal. Now, what most people haven't understood is that when the Lord is coming, at the end of the sixth seal, he's not coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. He's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And that is where most people have gotten confused. Because when you have Matthew only eyes and you're unaware of it, you think everything must be put together because he only comes once feet down at the, at the Mount of Olives. Well, I'm going to show you that this is when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion and not the Mount of Olives. And you just saw it right there when uh, at the sixth seal, at the end of the sixth seal. And you just saw it in Revelation chapter 12, verse five, before the was caught up with the rod of iron. So here he is, he's now being present, he's arriving. And look at what it says in verse 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You following how incredible this is to, to, to understand? to take the time and to process, to see what's going on. All of this is followed in order from the pre-trib escape to the 40 days of the Son of Man to the first two and a half years of seals to when the red dragon gives power to the beast and the 42 months begin to the time of the sixth seal, the stars falling to the end of the sixth seal, the man-child shows up to rule with the rod of iron this is all the first four churches 
of the first six years of seals and the above, which is the 50 days, and after the rod of iron, when the man child comes, which is the son of man coming on heavenly Mount Zion, as you see at the end of the sixth year of seals and at the end of the sixth seal, then you get, and her child was caught up. So where was this was caught up? Remember what I said earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Here's the second group. Was caught up. And where does this was caught up group go? They don't go to the third heaven like the group that was like a rapture. This one is the was rapture. What does this one say? This is the was rapture. This is the one that goes to paradise, which is what? What the Lord is coming on. He's coming with heavenly Mount Zion, the, the mountain carved without hands, the place he went to prepare for them. It's fantastic. Look at this. If you go to Daniel chapter 7, in Daniel chapter 7, look at what we have here. We have the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Then the beast comes. And the beast, there's his 10 horns. He's given power to continue. For 42 months, what does he do? He takes the power over all of these three, and he's worse than all of them combined. This is the time when they flee into the wilderness. Until what? The Ancient of Days did come. And when the Ancient of Days comes, what happens? The Antichrist is killed. The beast is killed. And then what do we see? The rest of the beast had their dominions taken away, but their lives were still extended. And now look. And then the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. This word with actually means in the clouds of heaven, just like Mark's discourse. So now when we go back into Mark's discourse, chapter 13, watch this. In Mark's discourse, chapter 13, we've passed now the abomination of desolation. There he is, man child coming, the Son of Man coming, stars of heaven falling. There he is coming in. So it's the word in. It does mean in the clouds with power and glory. Hello. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. This is exactly what you're seeing. Look at this. How about we go to Psalms 110? Let me show you the timing of Psalms 110. In Psalms 110, we read, the Lord said unto my Lord, so the Father said unto the Son, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, Father, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. The rod of his strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So here he is. He's now king and high priest Melchizedek with his rod out of Zion, ruling still in the midst of his enemies. It's so fascinating. Who are the ones going in the rapture? Well, who are the ones that are going to go to him and rush to him in the rapture time? We see it in Romans 15, verse, two, uh, verse 12. Again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, come and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. This is the time of the rapture. That This is what's coming. Remember, when we got to the end of Thyatira, it's the end of the sixth seal. So he was seen coming. This is the man-child coming, the, the rod of iron. But the rapture didn't happen until after this sixth year representation comes to an end. This is the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And what is it called? It's Sardis, and it's time for what? The Reformation. The Church of the Reformation, which is a period that's called a period of Israel's kings. <laughs> it's a period of Israel's kings. So let's go read a little bit about Sardis. Just get some points over it. Look at what it says. Um, turn, watch, and repent. So if thou shalt not watch, then I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you. There are a few names. Oh, listen to this. There are a few names. Um, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that cometh, the same shall be cloaked in white garment. See, walk with me in white. Walk with me in white. Be watching. 
Be watching. So check what happens. Go back to Mark 13. And look at what we see at the end of Mark 13. So if we're following the storyline, we just saw the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And now, what does he tell them? So he's warning here at the end, right? Uh, Son of Man had taken a long journey, authority to his servant. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the Master cometh. He ends Mark's discourse with saying in verse 37, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So you've got this dual watch happening again, but it gets even better than that. Because now in Revelation chapter seven, we're seeing two things happen, which is the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And you're seeing the 144,000 sealed. And look at what you see. This is the great multitude rapture. You have those that are what? Clothed with white. And another group that has palms in their hands. The palms in their hands represents those who were alive at the great multitude rapture. And the clothed in white robes are the ones who were beheaded. The ones who were killed. Listen to this. Verse 13 of uh, Revelation 7. And one of the elders saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? Look at this word. When you go into this word, you know where you find it? Jesus in the resurrection story of Mark 16. You see, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white raiment. This clothed in a long white raiment, let me show you. This word is only used eight times, and it's only used right here in, in, all of the, in all of the resurrection stories. It's only this one. So remember how the resurrection stories are different. Well, when you go into this, these teachings here, you can go to this, you can go to this video right here, pre, mid, and post and watch the transfiguration, triumphal entry, and the resurrection stories that give us all pictures and typologies of the pre, mid, and post hidden within them. So what you're seeing here is this long raiment and a single one standing there. So you've got it different in Luke, you got it different in Mark, and you got it different in Matthew. This is a picture of the Lord coming at the end of the six years of seals, and there he is in a long raiment. We go to Revelation chapter 7, and look at what it says about these guys. They're the same, they're, they're being given the same white raiment. They're being given the same long white robes. And what did it say in Sardis? It's the picture of the seventh year of seals. <laughs> like I said, it all follows in order. And as you keep tracking this, you see it everywhere. If you go back to the sixth, uh, to the fifth seal, you see the ones that were given the white robes. Here it is right here. The ones that were given the white robes, it's the same ones. <laughs> it's so fantastic. It's, it's just, it's brilliant to be able to follow and to track it and to see it. it it's, it's absolutely incredible. So let's see what it says here. So Sardis now, so we're in the seventh year of seals. The Lord has come on heavenly Mount Zion. He's there on Mount Zion. We know in the midst of seals, the foundation, the spiritual foundation was being laid by the apostles. And what did it say for the apostles? It said that theirs would be paradise. Well, now he's come on paradise, so they would be gone to paradise. And the foundation, there would be a physical foundation that was laid during seals. And now we have what? The time of Israel's king, <coughs> which of course is Jesus. He's here. It's the Reformation time. The Lord is here. So look at what happens next. If we follow this story and see where it takes you into the rest of Revelation and into the story of the kings. Look at what we get here in Revelation 14. This has messed up a lot of people. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion 
and with them 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Well, let's make sure this is what it says it is. Revelation chapter 14. And let's read it with the Strong's Concordance at our fingertips when it says the 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. The word in doesn't actually mean in, it means on. So having the father's name written on their foreheads. Well, lo and behold, if we now follow this through and we're now looking at the 144,000 who are about to follow the Lord and be with them, we have the church of Philadelphia is represented as who? The walls. They're the next group of workers and they represent the 144, which are the walls because the city and the streets and the temple are going to be built <clears throat> excuse me, during the first half of trumpets. And look at what it says about them. In Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee. You see, he's going to keep them. He's going to keep watch over them. He's not taking them out. He's going to keep watch over them. Remember, he's now high priest and king Melchizedek, and they are the priestly line that is going to, that are going to follow him wheresoever he goes. And it says, but I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. <coughs> Excuse me. This final hour of temptation relates to the end, very end of tribulation. <clears throat> now listen to what it says about them. We come down here in Revelation 3.12, and we go to the bottom portion, oh, right here, about midway through. And it says, and I will write, uh, and I will write upon him the name of my God. I will write upon him the name of my God. Who got written? The name of God was written on their foreheads. 144,000. Are you seeing how it all tracks in order? And then it says, uh, in the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Well, lo and behold, what comes after foundations? After foundations, you have walls. And who are the walls represented by? 144. 144 represented by the walls. And they're the ones that have the name of God written on their foreheads. They're the ones standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. You see, people could never understand why was, how, how are they standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb? It was impossible to understand. Because it must have been in heaven. No, it's because at the end of the sixth seal, heavenly Mount Zion has come down. Paradise has come down. And now, when you look at Zechariah chapter 8, look at it like the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. And look at what it says. I am returned unto Zion. It's now called the holy mountain of the Lord. And he tells them, now let your hands be strong. You that here in these days, okay, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. So now they're about to start building the temple at the beginning of trumpets. And you've got the 144,000 there. They represent the spiritual walls that are going to be built during the time of seals, uh, uh, during the first half of trumpets on the foundations of the spiritual foundations while a physical one was laid during seals. And we can prove all this in 1 Kings. <clears throat> Excuse me, how fitting that it's 1 Kings when it's the time of Israel's kings, which is represented by First and Second Kings. When the Son of Man has come on heavenly Mount Zion and then the temple is about to be rebuilt. Look at what it says. In the fourth year was the foundation of the Lord's, <coughs> excuse me, of the house of the Lord laid. So this would be in the fourth year. So about three and a half years into seals, the foundation is laid. Then in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years total into trumpets, it's all a typology. It's a picture typology in the end. So in the 11th year, in the, uh, in the eighth month, was the house finished? So how long did it take? It took seven years to build. 
In the first four, only the foundation was done. So about three and a half years into seals, the foundation is laid, a physical foundation, while a spiritual one is being laid. And then it took seven years to build because it's the first half, three and a half years of trumpets, where the house is going to be built and the walls and the city is getting repaired. And it'll be done in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in. And where do we find this? First Kings. First Kings. It all follows the entirety of the storyline. Look what happens now. <clears throat> As we get to Philadelphia, they're the, the missionary, right? They're the ones that go out during the first half of trumpets, and then they're going to be given power, greater power to go during the second half of trumpets. And look what happens when we get to this period of, uh, of mid-trumpets time. Now we have it. It's called the period of Israel's removal. The period of Israel's removal. Why would you suddenly have the period of Israel's removal? That's because now comes the time when Messiah is cut off. In this, after this temple has been built, this 11th year, about 10 and a half years into tribulation, this is what you read about in Daniel chapter 12, in Je Daniel chapter 9, when Messiah gets cut off. In verse 26, you have the seven weeks and then the about three and a half, and Messiah is cut off. This is now mid trumpets time. This mid trumpets brings you to the fifth trumpet. When we see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, after the 1260 days after the rapture, you've got your 1260. Now you're at mid trumpets. And now the dragon and his guys are cast down, having lost their battle against Michael. And when he's cast down, heaven's rejoicing and saying, Whoa to them who are on the earth, because this woe is the first woe of the final three trumpets of woes which begins with the fifth trumpet when he's cast down and the pit is open. You seeing how it all follows all the way through. What's happening during these 1260 days of the first half of trumpets? The temple's being rebuilt. The two witnesses are there. And the temple and the city and the streets are being rebuilt. The 144 are there. They're the walls, representative. And then at mid-trumpets after it's all built, Satan is cast down and the pit is opened. That first woe is just as you read here <clears throat> when Messiah is cut off and the fifth angel comes and he's got what? The key to the bottomless pit. Who comes out of the bottomless pit, guys? We know who comes out of the bottomless pit. It's the beast that was. Remember what happened? The beast that was because he had 42 months and then at the end of the six years of seals, Messiah killed him as we saw in Daniel chapter 7, he was killed. So then during the first half of trumpets, he is not. And then it says what? And he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. This is mid-trumpets when he goes into perdition. The was is the second half of seals. The is not is the first half of trumpets. And the shall ascend is that mid-trumpets. And what is this mid-trumpets when the son of perdition comes out of the bottomless pit, which is the fifth trumpet? You see, this is what I mentioned in one of the shorts. Second Thessalonians chapter two, chapter 2 has nothing to do with the period of pre-trib. It is all about 10 and a half years into tribulation. This is the part of Matthew's discourse that we'll show in a moment as we bring it to a close when it says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and the man of sin revealed the son of perdition. I just showed you the son of perdition isn't until Messiah cuts off, Satan's cast down and the pit is opened and that's when he returns. That is when he's going to declare himself God and, and he's going to say he's above God. Satan is, of God, uh, is God and everything else. You see, now all three of them will be there because false prophet wasn't killed. Only Antichrist was killed. Satan's now cast down. So now you've got Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet there. And this is 
mid trumpets about 10 and a half years in which like i said now brings us to matthew's abomination of desolation and look at what it says stand in the holy place this is the one that means standing in the temple because the temple was rebuilt during the first half of trumpets now like i did in mark let me show you this quickly in mark's discourse <clears throat> before the abomination there were no false prophets mentions and no antichrist mention it wasn't until the second half after the abomination of desolation in mark's discourse that then false prophets and false christ show up and then what do we know happens at the end of the sixth year of seals antichrist is killed but false prophet is let go but his power is taken away and look at what we see in the first half of trumpets of mark of matthew's discourse false prophet is still mentioned but not false christ in the first half not until the abomination of desolation when satan's cast down and the pit is open and this is the fleeing into the wilderness that then you have the time that's going to be worse than it ever was in all of human history and will never be this bad ever again and look who shows up again false christs and false prophets you see these word plays and where they're placed it's absolutely brilliant and so where does this bring us to this brings us to where the period of israel's kings and israel is now being removed it's the removal time so now you're at mid trumpets they were out there doing their missionary work the first half of trumpets and then look what happens the cutoff comes because the pit is opened the apostasy when the pit is open and the son of perdition comes when the antichrist when the beast comes back this is at the mid trumpets point the mid trumpets the 10 and a half years when the pit is opened so you could really say this actually just takes you to the 10 and a half years but this will play out until the end of the 13th year of tribulation to the end of the sixth year of trumpets let me show you how this finishes off we see it right here in revelation chapter 12 when he's been cast out it's the first woe the dragon goes after them and they're flying away in the wilderness for a time and times and a half that's one plus two plus a half a time but that's where this group that that was there is now being protected they're flying on the wings of an eagle to a place protected to the end of the 14 years to the end of the seventh year of trumpets but how long does satan have satan's time we read in daniel chapter 12 that how long is he going to have how long oh lord and we're told that it's going to be for a time times and a half there's no end here so it's one two plus a half so two and a half years of the final three and a half years of tribulation of trumpets or the last two and a half of the three and a half years of trumpet judgments is going to be satan's ruling and reigning and it all starts at the first woe at the about 10 and a half year mark but this group is flying away on the wings of an eagle to the very end of the 14 years of tribulation but satan's reign is only two and a half of those final three and a half years so what happens now <clears throat> excuse me at the end of satan's two and a half years well we take it to matthew chapter 24 and in matthew chapter 24 look at what we read after the abomination of desolation there's your false christ your false prophets again then we see immediately after the tribulation of those days shall appear the sign of the son of man and look at what we get all the tribes now it's switching to the tribes because remember the tribes represent the 12 tribes which will be the gates that will go out during the millennial reign and what do they see coming 
the Son of Man coming in, but it doesn't mean in, it means on the clouds. This is when everybody will see him now, excuse me, from one end unto the other at the end of Satan's two and a half years while there's one year remaining. What is this period when he comes? It's the one in Zechariah 14 that most people know about when the Lord will return at this point after having been cut off, he will return feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, it is as Zechariah 14, one says, it is the day of the Lord. And as Isaiah 66, two, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. Brothers and sisters, that is the layout of the seven churches. And they were all just shown to you throughout the gospels, as well as, through Revelation chapter 12, following in the Gospels from Luke into Mark into Matthew, taking Revelation chapter 12, following it all the way through, showing that Revelation 12 is the above and first six years of seals, showing that Revelation chapter 3 and the last three churches are from the seventh year of seals to you could say the, the midpoint where Messiah is cut off and the midpoint of trumpets when Messiah is cut off and Satan has his portion to reign for two and a half years. However, the Laodicea will take it right to the end of the 13th year or the end of the two and a half years of Satan's reign where Satan, Antichrist, and false prophet will be there. And then the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives to finish it all up in the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. I would have loved to have been able to do this video shorter, but I pray that it blesses you. I pray that it was worth the hour of your time to begin to understand what it is, what the picture is in the revelation of the seven churches of the end of days. And this will really, really, truly help you to understand, to match them up in the was, in the is, to understand the revelation of the is to come. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.